mention illuminations and most people automatically think of Blackpool. But it's a little known fact that Heckmond Wyke in West Yorkshire was one of the first towns in the UK to have outdoor illuminations. The first of these illuminations can be traced back to the 1860s. Kim Strickson is Community History Projects Manager for Kirklees Museums and Galleries. I think we first heard about the illuminations um, when someone from Heckman White got in touch with us and they knew that we did community history projects and said, look, you know, we've got this amazing history in the town of Heckman White. Did you know that the lights uh, were up in Heckman White long before Blackpool? And it would be great to tell the, the history of that and get people involved. Heckman Wyke, I think, was a very independent-minded town. In 1840, it had its own gas works. And in 1844, we've got the first reference to streets being lit by gas. And so I guess we, we can presume from that that that's why it was in some, some ways easy to illuminate the town for celebrations if it had its own gas works. I think there are illuminations alive and well in Heckman Wyke from the 1860s onwards. They weren't necessarily electrically powered. We've got newspaper cuttings and council minutes, things like that, that tell us that there were gas illuminations in the town, celebrating things like royal visits, uh, special, special occasions, special festivals. And we've got a lovely, lovely report um, about the opening of the market in 1868 and that definitely mentions gas-powered illuminations rather large and splendid as well um, right across the road over archways plumes um, they're described as feathers and crowns of flame so I think they were doing really imaginative things as far back as that it wasn't until about 1900 that we get the first mention of electricity but th then again it was a mixture of gas and electricity. The early lights in Heckman Wyke I think were more sort of emblematic um, like crowns and uh, things that related to royalty a, a lot of those sort of things and flags, uh, um, feathers, uh, badges but later on, obviously, they got more quirky. We've got a very early reference to Christmas lights from 1885 that's actually recorded in Heckman Wyke Urban Council Minutes. And it mentions a sum of money, it's something between 45 and 50 pounds, that was spent that year on festooning the town with lights. We think, obviously, at that time, there would have been gas fired. We've got lots of photographs in the archives of the way Heckman White look, used to look, but unfortunately, we don't have any of, of, the, of that, of these amazing sort of uh, gas-fired uh, decorations. Once they had this power unleashed in Heckman White, both gas and electricity, they seemed to have just taken it on board, that right, we can do amazing things with this, we can add to our celebrations. And before they knew where they were, people were coming in trains and coach loads to actually see the lights in Heckman Wyke from as far as, you know, as far away as Derbyshire, um, other counties, to see these amazing lights of Heckman Wyke. Um, I'd, I'm not sure if it was one person at a Heckman Wyke Urban Council meeting that said, you know, we, sh we should be doing lights, we haven't got any record of that. But there just seems to, it comes through all the documentation and all the newspaper reports and everything we've found, that um, desire to celebrate and, and, to, and to let everybody share in that. And then, I think by about 1905, then we've got um, electric lights and the gas, the references to gas seemed to disappear and they were powered by Heckman Wyke's own electricity uh, little company on Bath, Bath Road, Bath Street I think and then from then on it's lights, lights, lights um, all sort of 
went into decline during the war years, obviously with the blackout, but as soon as the war was over, they were back with a vengeance and made, I think, 20, a set of 24 new lights. And these were all made by members of uh, people who were working for the council at the time. Um, and uh, very, we've got photographs of those, lovely photographs, from, especially from the early 1950s. And they're, they're, they continue to be quite quirky, though, because even in the, in the 50s, we've got things like boxing cats and a lighthouse, not necessarily images that you associate with, with Christmas, but just, uh, just amazing images and cranes and birds in, in the water. Lovely, lovely little sequence of um, water birds. Um, two men rowing a boat. Cinderella and a coach, that's more sort of pantomime I guess. Um, but also a windmill. Um, there was at one point, I think, the Seven Dwarves from Snow White, and a lovely story about somebody getting a bit drunk on Christmas Eve and running off with two of them, one under each arm, I seem to remember. So, yeah, a whole variety of lights, not just stars and angels and the things you usually so with, associate with Christmas, but almost like storytelling characters and, and some that you just can work out quite where they come from. Obvious parallels can be drawn between Heckman Wyke and Blackpool. Blackpool historian and writer Terry Regan explains how Blackpool's now world-famous illuminations came about. Um, by the time the 1870s came around, Blackpool was becoming a major tourist destination. As such, it was always looking for ways to draw the customers in, and they were always in the forefront of technological advance. Um, the Siemens Company of Germany, the Anglo-German Company, I should say, had been doing lighting experiments in towns and cities up and down the country. Blackpool Council had got to hear about this and had invited them in to do a series of experiments on the promenade with an eye to providing public street lighting and or a tourist attraction. Um, the, the first results were rather dismal failures, but by the next year, by 1879, uh, the Siemens Company felt confident enough to send a deputation to the town and say, now look, we've perfected these lights, how about putting on this show? So the town council obviously would give it some thought and they came up with the conclusion, yes, this could be a good thing because nobody in the world has yet got permanent electric street lightings. We'd like to be the first town thus. And also it could prove to be a massive draw for tourism. So in 1879, they inaugurated what was to become the world's first uh, permanent street lighting that is lit by electricity. Apparently they beat New York City by one day where they uh, successfully lit Broadway. Um, and such was the attraction at the time of electrical lighting that a crowd of no less than 100,000 people turned up in the town to watch it. The original lighting uh, consisted of arc lights uh, strung atop 60 foot high stanchions uh, or lamp standards as we might, might call them today. There were six of these on the promenade um, roughly forming a quadrangle from where stands now the Cenotaph by North Pier, Talbot Square and heading slightly southwards towards where the tower stands now but didn't then because it hadn't yet been built. And the tallest building on the promenade was then the Prince of Wales Theatre, which also had one of these arc lights mounted in front of a parabolic um, mirror. And the same on North Pier. So these could be moved through 360 degrees and create all kinds of lighting effects. So great was the success of this inaugural show, they decided to have it uh, on a permanent basis. And so it grew over the years. That, um, by 1891, there were several dozens of these um, arc lights on the, on the poles uh, strung along the promenade. And in 1891, they actually decided to light up the promenade uh, or the area of the promenade that contained these lights for the Christmas and New Year period. And that's, as far as we know, that's the first time they were officially used at the Christmas period. Um, obviously, over the years, they had special uh, Christmas light shows which stood in their own right, but they didn't come for many years. The very first illuminations display as we would know them today, that's a modern display, took place in April 1912 
when Princess Louise came to open a new stretch of the promenade, exactly where the cenotaph by the North Pier stands today. The official name of the gardens in which the cenotaph stands is the Princess Louise Gardens, although it's a name hardly used today. And that area was specifically lit and it would the lighting was so advanced it would fit into a modern scheme, it wouldn't seem out of place. And that became such a huge draw that they then decided to have them permanently on an, on an annual basis. And a few years later, they decided to extend them into the Christmas period. Now, the idea was originally to have a period of lighting on the promenade and the adjacent streets to enable the tourist season to be extended into the autumn. Because traditionally, once the end of summer had come and the dark nights had come, the people didn't come. Now the streets were lit and there were gay lights everywhere, coloured lights of every hue. The people started to come in the droves. So what started off as an experimental basis uh, of a two or three weeks then became two or three months. It was not until the late 1920s or the early 30s that actual Christmas displays as we would know them now were inaugurated because often they, the lights would finish just before Christmas. They would anticipate that people wouldn't come over the Christmas period either because they would want to stay at home or they didn't have the transport or possibly didn't have the money. But by the time the 30s had rolled around and working men were starting to get cars and were able to take day trips freely, um, they'd started to come and stay over the Christmas period and for New Year. So the council thought, well, why not have just a special Christmas lights display? Uh, and that's more or less how they evolved. And that's how it is today, really. I was quite surprised um, some years ago when I was doing the research for, for a book I subsequently wrote called Lamp to Laser, which chronicles Blackpool's history, Illuminations history, was um, I'd, I'd received a letter from a chap in Heckman White in West Yorkshire stating that they'd had the lights long before Blackpool and that I ought to put that in the story. Sadly, I dismissed it. I thought that perhaps he was a crank and he got it wrong. I now know different. I know that Heckman White has been quite a big player in the field of illuminations, especially in, in gaslit illuminations, which incidentally Blackpool had uh, originally. Over the years, many aspects have, have evolved around the Blackpool illuminations, and one of the most interesting features has always been the, uh, the illumination switch on ceremony, which is a kind of a show within a show, if you will, and some of the most famous people in the world uh, not just in, in Britain, in the whole world have switched on Blackpool Illuminations, one of whom stands out very loud and clear, and that was Sir Stanley Matthews, the Blackpool, Stoke City and England footballer who, who graced the turf of Wembley and various grounds up and down the country for many years. Um, an interesting aspect about Sir Stan and his team, who incidentally, after winning the 1953 FA Cup, in probably the most famous final ever, were asked to switch on the illuminations, was the fact that he wore for many years Goliath boots, which were made in Heckman White by the local co-op boot, boot factory. And apparently he got a small fee for signing his name to these boots, just a drop in the ocean compared to what a player would get today. And he would frequently go to Heckman White for personal fittings of his boots, because he insisted that they literally fit him like a glove. I think from the 1960s onwards, the weather, uh, general wear and tear, the lights started, were starting to look a little bit tatty and tired. Um, and there wasn't the same money around to, to actually either fix them, mend them, or make a new set. And so it was down to individuals in the town, and there were a few individuals in the town who worked really hard to keep them going, um, to rejuvenate them in some instances. But it, I don't think it was ever quite the same, that heyday between sort of 1920s to 1950s. That, that was the time when they were amazing and people talked about them um, from, from all over the country, really. Um, but after that, it was a bit of, it seems to be, 
have been a bit of a struggle to get to continue continue them and to keep them alive and as bright and sparkly as they were. In 1985, Heckman Dwyke celebrated the centenary of its first Christmas illuminations. Jeff Capes, Linda Nolan and Vince Hill contributed to the festivities, drawing a crowd of 9,000 people. In 2005, Kirklees Community History Unit created an exhibition celebrating the illuminations. Once we talked to everybody and asked them about their memories of the lights in Heckman White, we visited quite a few uh, day centres where a lot of older people um, would know and remember a lot about the lights. Then we had to decide what to do with it. Um, and we decided the best thing would be to create an exhibition that, that everybody could see that could be on view in Heckmanwijk. And right from the start, we knew whatever we did, we'd have to have lights in it. That, that made sense. So um, our museum designers put their heads together and came up with a, a design where you had eight panels that told the story of the lights, but also each frame, each panel was framed with, with lights, with, with coloured light bulbs. And then came the challenge to to decide where shall we put this so that everybody can see it. And there wasn't a, an obvious public building to put it in. So uh, the uh, the little hospice shop came forward in, in Heckman White and said, well, you can put it in our window, which was wonderful because it was in the heart of Heckman White. We actually had a little launch event there when we invited all the people who'd given us stories, uh, shared stuff with us to come and see it. As part of the 2005 exhibition, Artist Shaquilla Mumtaz was asked to design a series of new lights with local children. One of the designs was to be made into a new light for the town. At the end of the workshops, we put them all together as a group and sort of like took a, you know, where we all decided which one should be selected, which one shouldn't be. Um, and I think at the end, the decision was made that the light was actually um, made from different parts of children's and 3D models. So they took different, different ideas from each um, model, really, to make one light for the Heckman Dwight town. In the past on Heckman Dwight lights, I like the boxing cats. Um, I, think I li also like the peacock as well. Um, the boxing cats was my favourite because I think it's quite funny and um, you don't really see that type of, these type of lights in um, any of the towns nowadays and it just brings a kind of a smile to people's faces and I think children would um, enjoy looking at, you know, cartoon really and mixture of different types of lights which are related um, to, well, different, different things really, circus, um, jokes, cartoons. It's not just about one culture really. We had the facts and figures, but the personal stories and the little anecdotes are lovely. Um, everything, um, including there was a flood in Heckman White one particular year. And a lady told us about remembering her little boy standing at the living room window and saying, Mummy, there's an angel floating down the river. And she didn't know what he meant and looked outside and it was actually an angel light that had been taken off a building uh, by two lads and they turned it upside down and it was hollow inside of course and got in it and, and used it as a canoe um, and sailed down, sailed down the flooded, I don't think it was a river, I think the, the streets were just flooded with water. Um, so there's that and, and just people's memories of just how many people were pouring into the town to see the lights. Uh, people do describe special coach trips of people coming in. And we do have a picture of one of a bus actually coming into Heckman White that's completely covered in lights itself. So that was another sort of surprise. Um, just everything was, was, was decorated, even the buses that people were arriving in. And lots and lots of um, specially commissioned trains to bring people in to see the lights. So, the atmosphere must have just been incredible in the town. Although today's Christmas lights in Heckman Wyke are not quite as extravagant as the illuminations of the past, there are obvious influences from the early designs in today's lights. And the town still comes out in force to celebrate the annual light switch on. <laughs> Eight, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hey! Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody.